uh, then form this uh, T shape, right? This will be the completion of the space station. Now, this whole thing, this whole process has taken, if it's completed on schedule, just two years, really. Uh, what do you think of the speed of this whole process? Well, uh, this, uh, as I said, the uh, process had been delayed somehow by the hiccup of the Long March 5 uh, testing flights. But also, the, the there is a loss. Yeah, yeah, there's a quick recovery and then also we call zero down of the problems and issues and, and so we can tackle the problems yeah. and solve the problems uh, of the Long March 5. And also, uh, uh, there is a comparison yeah. between the, uh, the Chinese spacecraft, uh, space station and the International Space Station. Mm. Uh, International Space Station is much bigger, it's like a football course. Uh, but it, well, the segment is, contr uh, is contributed by different countries. Uh, the yeah. Chinese uh, sp space station is autonomously yeah. built so it can be assembled on the ground before we disassemble them and yeah. send them to space to mm -hmm. assemble again. So we have a, many yeah. advantages. And the Wintian and Montian are different uh, testing yeah. facilities. That is also, uh, we have the state-of-the-art technology that can be, uh, can be available yeah. today in comparison with 20 or 30 years ago when they built the International Space Station. So there are many agilities and advantages of the Chinese station that can be available to the Chinese uh, space sector. What sort of um, uh, key technologies do you think are, are really notable, worth yeah. mentioning? Well, I think um, uh, uh, the yeah. combustion is one of the traditional ways, uh, what we call a combustion chamber in, in, in space. So that is, uh, that is very conventional. But there are some uh, novelties. For example, the engineer have just mentioned that there is a uh, robotic uh, trans transmitting uh, airlock mm. that can be tra yeah. transmitting uh, the cargoes from uh, from inside the Tengong uh, to outside uh, uh, with no human presence. So the astronauts do not have to perform a EVA mm -hmm. to bring the, yeah. the payloads. Which is safer and, and everything. Exactly. And also there's uh, more than 30, uh, we'll call it yeah. uh, uh, deployment port uh, on board the uh, Meng Tian. Mm. So that is exposed to outer space. For example, if you put a spacecraft out there, uh, in, the, uh, in one of the port, mm -hmm. it can supply power, uh, communication, and data transmission uh, to the payload before it was deployed to outer space and, uh, and leave the station. So these are some of the novelties and, and new, uh, new things that is, uh, we have uh, designed into the uh, uh, particular Meng Tian segment. Uh, for uh, uh, in comparison with the traditional stations. Mm. So we were hearing um, earlier the um, engineers and giving us an introduction about the sort of functions that the Meng Tian will be carrying out and it is primarily for studying microgravity, um, fluid physics. So what are some of the experiments you think we might expect to see? Well let's say in, uh, in comparison with uh, Wen Tian, Wen Tian is more what we call a uh, biotechnology mm. experiments uh, like uh, uh, um, uh, microbes and uh, growing seeds, for uh, yeah, example, we saw seeds and, and growth of plantations and vegetations, oh, and, and also uh, 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 crystalline uh, crystallizations. Uh, where, in comparison with that, uh, Meng Tian is more focused on material science. What we call it material science, you can do combustions, mm -hmm. uh, fluid dynamics, uh, uh, cryo, cryo, uh, extreme cryo uh, temperature. Oh. Uh, as a study of the of metals, so these are focused more on the material science itself. Uh, so the character of different elements, uh, in comparison with uh, with the mountain. So that makes it complete. And also we have an exposed segment. Right. Yeah. This is very interesting. Yes. Uh, the exposed segment uh, is is uh, is not available on on uh, Meng Tian. So the Meng Tian has uh, its own uh, unique novelty. As I mentioned, there are more than thirty. Uh, uh, deployable uh, ports available on these uh, segments, so they can deploy different payloads on board uh, on board the station to outer space. For example, uh, if you uh, move a, a satellite into uh, the Tiangong, and the astronauts can work on the uh, on the satellite itself. So the the Meng Tian has the availability of the uh, robotic airlock that can transport the satellite to the. Uh, what we call deployment port, and then deploy to outer space. So we can we can launch the satellite without using a rocket. Oh. Well, we're looking at uh, pictures now of the uh, rocket, and that's uh, ready for launch in about 17, 17 minutes or so, 20 minutes or so. And then um, also um, we're hearing some signals from the ground control there um, at the launch site, and I think the second check has just been completed, and it's. Um, 
Uh, Mr. Xu, so about these uh, exposed sections for these experiments, I mean, this is this is this would be really interesting. And but does this necessarily so involve the, um, the astronauts themselves having to go outside to do, or can it all be controlled from the inside the lab? Well, I think the exposed segment is the, the whole idea of that is to uh, to have a robotic uh, maneuverability of the exposed segment. I of course, this exposed segment is not new. We have the Japanese Kibo segment. Uh, on board the International Space Station that also has exposed uh, experiments. But the deployment port and the automatic, uh, what we call it, uh, robotic uh, transport airlock is something uh, uh, new for the, for the station. So uh, we have also, as you remember, there is a robotic arm on board this station, you know, yeah. one big ones and a couple and of smaller one, ones, yeah. and they're quite adaptive and they can, use, they can be used for maneuvering uh, the cargoes and the satellites itself. So there are many ways that the astronaut do not have to go out uh, to do this. Uh, their robotic availabilities uh, to the uh, deployment of the station and uh, deployment of the uh, space probe and also uh, the external uh, maneuverability uh, of the exposed segment. Mm. Will this be uh, adding a lot more to the astronauts' workload then once the Munkian arrives? I mean, they have double the uh, amount of experiments to do, or possibly more. I'm, I must say that they will have a lot of a lot of things to do. I think uh, uh, for material science, it's, uh, it's, you, it's not like uh, a plantation that you can uh, put the uh, the racks and the the boxes and the port together and just see the the uh, the results uh. as they grow very slowly. But combustion can happen very quickly. Mm. Fluid dynamics you have to record very carefully. Uh, all the material uh, studies has to be recorded. So uh, this is why the astronaut sometimes needs. Uh, particular trainings uh, for scientific missions and this is why also the International Space in, uh, Station as well as uh, future stations, we'll call, uh, there are a number of uh, commercial uh, stations that is uh, going to be launched uh, in the coming uh, years. Uh, they also focused on, on scientific oriented yeah. missions mm -hmm. and the scientists on site is more important than the, uh, yeah. the pure astronauts themselves mm -hmm. because uh, you, ha you have to have a scientific background to understand some of the experiments and studies are performed on the microgravity environment on the, on the station. But that's the direction that we'll be seeing with China's future astronauts, isn't it? At the moment, these astronauts are, you know, the trained in, say, pilots uh, background, for example. But in the future, I think the future batches, we might expect to see more scientists going up there. Exactly. The, the Chinese men's space program started with, uh, uh, in 1992 with zero um, uh, background. So this is, uh, you know, from scratch, we have to have uh, uh, designs and manufacturing of the spacecraft as well as the, uh, the support of the life support system on board the station is, very, is focused on, uh, well, let's say healthy candidates. I mean, uh, physical fitness is, is very important for the beginning of the mission. But once you have a mature technologies, uh, for example, the station is uh, stabilized uh, and, and it's operating very stable and, and normal. And also the launching is very frequent and safe. So you have uh, you have uh, a, a you know normal human that can tolerate these uh, mm. travels and stay a sustainable stay in station to perform the scientific missions. So that is what we're seeing. Uh, we're uh, we're looking forward in the coming future. Where they're selecting the third batch mm. of their astronauts, and also they have international collaborations with the European and ESA uh, countries mm. that they can uh, choose the appropriate astronauts to perform the right mission. 20 minutes to go now till the scheduled launch. But the astronauts up there at the moment with the Shenzhou, the Shenzhou 14 crew, I mean, they will be um, doing some of these experiments in the Meng Tian, so I mean, they're obviously being trained in this as well. Um, what do you think are some of the kind of the major tasks for them that they'll be doing? Well, I think the, uh, the Wen Tian has already uh, provided them with a number of uh, programs uh, for uh, protein crystallization and space seeding. Uh, space seeding is one of the important thing because of the agricultural benefits uh, that you can derive from these programs. Uh, you expose the seeds to outer space, uh, for example, for uh, with uh, microgravity environment, and also expose them to uh, radiations that is stronger than than Earth. So we, we're cultivating them and choose the right seeds so they can have a more uh, a more productive uh, cultivation and productive. Uh, production of the uh, agricultural grains. So these are uh, some of the, uh, the missions they're doing. So uh, for, uh, for the Meng Tian mission, I think they're, they're more challenging because their material science and, and 
uh, material physics are, are, uh, and are, uh, fluid dynamics are very, mm. uh, very scientific oriented. So the, uh, I think the, the astronaut has to read the menu very carefully to perform these missions. Uh, and also I think there are many ground, uh, ground crews and scientific communities are supporting them on the ground mm. uh, because the communication is very easy. Uh, it has been made easy for the astronauts uh, thanks to the telecommunication uh, satellites uh, that is operating on, on geostationary uh, stations. So we have a, a non-stop uh, communication with the station 24-7 uh, uh, at this moment. So astronauts conditions, uh, space station uh, telemetry and uh, parameters can be uh, timely transmitted to the ground control uh, station. Uh, as you have just heard that they are rehearsing a, num a number of times for TTNC missions. So these are very important elements for performing scientific missions and supporting astronauts' uh, life in, in orbit. Right, uh, um, Mr. Xu, you mentioned seeding that earlier. I actually remember that we um, watched one of the uh, class, the, the science lectures from the space station together. So I, the, the last one that was held, um, actually the astronauts showed us uh, a little sample that they did of seeds, right? And one of the children watching from Earth asked a very good question, how does the seed know which way is up? So I want to test your knowledge here. <laughs> I think the seeds doesn't know uh, which way is up, up uh, because uh, what we call uh, photosynthesis <laughs> is very important for the, uh, for the uh, plantations and, and vegetations. I, I think the seeds looks for, search for lights uh, <laughs> instead of search for directions. <laughs> That's right, that was, the, that was the big reveal that we had. I mean, I was, I was you know, trying to figure it out myself. So. <laughs> Well, also, they, they're doing a lot of uh, other things like uh, uh, silkworms and spiders. They put them to space uh, station mm. to let them to, uh, to uh, form their own webs. And, uh, and on Earth, they know the gravity and they know how to operate. And so they have to perform this same mission, you know, like a uh, uh, spider web on, yeah. on station. So oh, that we didn't get to see that. <laughs> Hopefully next time they'll do yes, this. They, this was done, I think, more or less on the International Space Station already. Oh, so. wow. <laughs> I wonder if um, they'll be doing something like this in the future on the Meng Tian and the Wen Tian. But the Meng Tian, so there's a, a lot of, there will be a lot of international cooperation as well on the China Space Station, right? And I know a lot of um, uh, some global uh, ideas, experiments have been pitched and some of them have already been selected. Do you have any, um, can you tell us about some of them? Well, I think there are more than uh, 60 uh, has been proposed to the, uh, to the uh, China Man Space Office. Uh, and also, uh, we, we're using the, uh, the United Nations. There's an office for outer space affairs, UN WUSA. They're, mm. they're uh, performing this mission for, uh, on our behalf to all the, uh, all the countries, in particular developing countries. Uh, the, there are uh, different criteria. Uh, the criteria, uh, I think one of them I remember is that they, do not, they have not done uh, this experiment on the International Space Station, and they, do, they have new novelties and they need to be uh, uh, timely manufactured. So these are, are some of the criteria and elements. Uh, we, I, my knowledge is that the first batch of nine, uh, nine projects has been selected, mm. uh, and I think some of them are being delayed, one or two of them, uh, because of te technical reasons. Uh, but some of, uh, most of them are preparing for their uh, trip to uh, the Chinese space station, and so they're also we, opening this again for the second batch. Well, they just announced the 15-minute countdown now until the launch of the Meng Tian module. So different time of countdown re uh, reflecting different uh, missions and tasking, uh, testings. Uh, for example, the 15 minute countdown would mean that the evac evacuation has to be performed of at the, the launch pad. Around the launch. So the, the people either has to be two kilometers away from the launch pad. Uh, so you see well, yeah, there one of the umbilical cord has been uh, disconnected and two of them has been disconnected. These are How providing so this uh, ubiquitous core is for providing, as you see, it's connected to yeah. the fairing itself, very much on top of the rocket. Mm. It is providing the electricity, communications, yeah. uh, and, uh, and, and battery uh, support and, uh, uh, to the payload itself, let's say the Meng Tian segment itself. So there, uh, there are different payloads that needs to be uh, charged and uh -huh. electronically switched on uh, for the whole process so that you can follow not only the rocket itself, but also the uh, the Meng Tian itself, uh, before it perform a number of uh, maneuvers. For example, once it's inserted in orbit, it has to be, uh, has to deploy the solar panels. So all of this needs power. So it, the, the Meng Tian itself is, is currently what we call switched on already. Mm -hmm. So it's on power. So the umbilical core provides some of the uh, ground segment power 
So once disconnected, the uh, the Meng Tian itself is on its own battery. Oh, right. uh, until the moment it deploys its solar panel to to provide it more charging. So, so it's currently to conserve power. Basically. Yes. So as I said, 15 minutes and less. You have to pe people have to evacuate the launch pad, mm. and there is also a closed up people that is, has has some bunkers uh, nearby. So you can you have oh. to hide yourself in the bunker. So. Um, but these are what we call environmentally friendly rocket. They do not have to highly toxic uh, uh, fuels. Mm. So uh, that is uh, one thing less uh, to worry about because uh, if you using conventional fuel, you have to use uh, the the mask uh, to you know to avoid any accidents. But that's people uh, being quite close to launch pad. Exactly, are, uh, and you know, also the people away in there. people are also fueling the the engine itself. So, uh, so this is uh, this is very very much uh, uh, what we call it environmentally friendly. You have to just worry about the safety itself. So you have to hide to the bunker, and right. uh, and the disconnection of the umbilical core uh, means that the launch uh, the launch is imminent. So uh, we will have uh, uh, very soon uh, the people who are who are gone from the launch pad itself. Is, uh, as we have just seen an hour ago, the uh, the journalist was there uh, reporting. All right, right. I think he that, needs to that was just about uh, he less said than a kilometer. Yeah, yeah, he said about three three hundred three hundred meters. Yeah, yes. three hundred meters away. Yeah. How far away is the uh, the con the ground control station then? Oh, well, the ground control station has a, a whole network of different uh, uh, ground stations. Mm. Uh, the, the 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 headquarters in Xi'an, so they they're in charge of all the controls and they're. Ground control station has a TTNC uh, linkage uh, uh, to the satellite, uh, uh, to the uh, lo uh, rocket, and also the satellite itself. So uh, there are different uh, uh, stations that are reporting to the to a whole network to right. control, and, and also its trajectory. And yeah, right. that's the uh, and also we have uh, infrared tracking and also optical tracking. Mm. These these stations are uh, located on site, close, very close to the launch pad. As we have just seen the crowd, and just behind the crowd, there's a there's a little hill, and there's a that provides the the optical uh, observation site. Mm. So observation uh, optical tracking is important for the first ten minutes uh, or first few minutes, I think, uh, if, uh, before uh, the rocket disappears right. uh, into outer space. And also, the infrared tracking uh, can continue uh, a little bit longer because that uh, when when you launch the uh, the rocket, you have a lot of very uh, big uh, infrared footprint that can mm -hmm. be uh, can be tracked, and also we can see from the ground. If you if you're seeing this on a clear day, you can see the separation of the four strap down boosters. Uh, that's uh, right. a few minutes before uh, after the launch, but I I uh, doubt I it, you know, in such a day. I'm I'm not sure you can see that all the way uh, up to. Uh, to the separation. I mean, the crowds at the beach that we were seeing just now, I mean, they're a few kilometers away from this. Uh, the, from this they are about uh, uh, eight kilometers away. Eight kilometers away. away. Yeah. And you, you, you know, from the beach, you can see there are two structures. Uh, this structure is for the Long March 5. There's another one for Long March 8, mm. uh, Long March 7. So, uh, uh, so the, these, these are two, strap, uh, two Ten minutes uh, to go. launch pads. And how how much would they be able to see from uh, where they are? I mean, eight kilometers away, but that seems like a, a long distance. But then I guess um, with the visibility being a bit low, but they, would they be able to feel much from the launch itself? I mean, I know if you're a, you know, two or three kilometers away, you can feel the vibrations, right? Uh, they can see the the lights. I mean, there's a uh, there's a you know a, a the firing from the, the the rockets. So they can see all the way, I think, uh, to the cloud, and also they can hear the, the acoustic sound of the, the, the rocket itself. Uh, two or three uh, kilometers may be very strong, can, sh can be shaking, but this distance, you can still hear it very clearly. All right, well, I think we are now just uh, th 10 minutes away from launch. So it's a pretty exciting moment, and the astronauts up uh, on the space station, what do you reckon they're doing right now? I mean, the docking is going to be completely automatic, so are they just sort of uh, just kicking back, relaxing, waiting, or is there a lot of, um, you know, important stuff for them to do as well? I think they're, they're tuned in to CGTN to watch <laughs> the launch. I mean, they're, I think they're, they're, uh, uh, they're listening to the uh, uh, ground control and command uh, communications. Uh, Particularly, uh, they have to be very uh, uh, careful in preparation of the, of the rendezvous docking. So, uh, at the, as we have seen this uh, uh, launching, uh, the, 
the astronauts probably have already performed uh, a, a very uh, dramatic maneuver of the station. So the station has to be turned around. Oh, right. uh, the rendezvous and docking port has to be prepared. Right. And airlock has to be prepared. And also, uh, there is also a, a detection of the uh, uh, Meng Tian uh, capsule once mm. it's in orbit, uh, either by uh, radio uh, communications and then by laser and then also by optical. So there are different aimings for the rendezvous and docking. So rendezvous and docking is very important and very uh, precise because if you have a, a collision, that means a catastrophe yes, because the, there will be an air leak and many other things. This happened in the uh, Russian station, or called Mir station. They had this accident before. So it has to be very careful in don rendezvous and docking and very precise. You mm -hmm. have to use laser beams and optical uh, alignment to, and also a control of the speed. And they would have prepared for this? Uh, this yeah. was prepared oh, as times. you, as this uh, was mentioned that this segment is prepared in Shanghai. Mm -hmm. I visited that academy, Shanghai Academy of uh, Spacecraft Technology, uh, Spaceflight Technology. Though they have a floating table, so they, uh -huh. they use the air to float the payloads. Mean and then they move the payloads around by themselves uh, to perform the rendezvous docking. Uh, testing on the table to simulate microgravity mm. environment. So the, the air floated uh, payload has been uh, prepared and has to be has at been the full size. At the full size, right. yeah. So it's very uh, so the, the the table is very big and also mm. the uh, the they perform this testing many times to to avoid any. Uh, Un unforeseenable uh, issues. Would so. the astronauts also have to train for manual docking in terms Maybe. of backup? Exactly. The astronaut has been trained uh, very well for uh, manual dockings and manual uh, disconnections oh. and uh, emergency uh, escape uh, plans. And there are many things that ha the astronaut has to be trained. So I think the astronauts currently is m very knowledgeable in mm -hmm. station. And, and also we have seen that the uh, astronaut has been sustaining Staying there uh, for a sustained period of time, and their mm. um, this crew has welcomed two segments. So they have the previous one experience. Right. So yes. they have something in their mind that they know what they're doing, and also uh, once this is done, they're oh, expecting three. another crew to come uh, at the end of this year. Six minute countdown now. Um, if, if things were to turn into a, a manual docking, so would it be the space station? Would the astronauts be moving the space station towards the? The, the lab module itself? Right. Well, I think uh, once it's turned into right. a manual docking, also you have to have a control on this on the uh, segment right. that you're going to be docked. Yeah. Uh, if you're docking with an uncontrolled, uncooperative object, then you have to maneuver the station itself. But the station is much bigger than the, than the uh, Meng Tian segment. So the segment has to be has to be controlled. So manual, even man manual docking, that means uh, tele-docking. Uh -huh. by controlling the Meng Tian segment uh, to dock with the station. And they uh, would have control of the Meng Tian segment from the space station as well, and it would, or would the control purely be with the ground staff? The ground staff has to, uh, to program, pre-program the whole random and docking programs right. and, and uh, what we call inserted into the testing of the satellite itself. And then uh, the ground control is, uh, is responsible for the random and docking at this moment. So if you, if you switch to manual, mm. that means the ground uh, give all the authority to the, to the astronauts. To the astronauts. Yes. Ah, okay. So the astronaut will have, to have, uh, will have uh, control of this spacecraft right, as well as the, the segment. I mean, how difficult is this? I mean, uh, I guess it's, it's hard to sort of compare, isn't it? But, uh, you know, we're talking, uh, I mean, two fairly huge objects in space finding each other, but, but in reality, in practice, this is uh, how challenging, you know, what kind of difficulty level? Well, there, there are two different categories. I think one is that you are working in, uh, and uh, orienting a, an unpro uncooperative object. That is more challenging. For example, if you, you are catching an astro uh, asteroid uh, uh -huh. with a spacecraft, that you have to maneuver yourself to around the astro asteroid. So this was part of the plan and the exploration programs in NASA. Uh, another one is the uh, both objects are controlled, mm -hmm. and you know the parameters, you know the orbit, you know the height, you know the speed. So that is relatively easy. And in particular, this one, you have the focus of the astronauts and the ground crews, 
and the stations. And you can cal carefully calculate, even starting from this moment, that's happening in five minutes. The launching time of the segment can, can be controlled in such a way that once you're in orbit, you're in alignment with the spacecraft, uh, with this uh, station. So that is more or less, uh, if you control the, uh, the uh, Meng Tian uh, precisely, that can have very easy rendezvous and docking. But uh, as I mentioned in the beginning of the program, that the uh, Meng Tian is uh, massive and the, one of the largest payloads uh, yeah. we have done uh, so far. So maneuverability is very important, in particular once it's in the orbit. Oh, the 23 oh, metric ton needs to be maneuvered very carefully. Three minute countdown now. Um, but uh, in the three minutes that we have, uh, Mr. Shu, so I just want to wrap my head around something if you're going to just explain to me. So, I mean, these objects, so, so the space station is, if left to its own devices, it drifts. Right, in space. So it, then turn, do these it turns, astronauts... tumbles, drifts, and, uh -huh. and, and, and comes down. I mean, the, we had experienced but... this, uh, 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 this before, at the, the previous mission of the testing mission. Uh, that was uncontrolled somehow. So uh, once it's, you're not controlling this, uh, it will come down uh, gradually. And uh, after 250 kilometers but... altitude, it comes down very quickly but... within weeks. Uh, so now we, we're talking about, you know, uh, for example, the International Space Station. It is fueled by the Russian. Uh -huh. uh, so the Russian is responsible for maintaining the altitude of the uh, of the uh, of the station. So right. you have to constantly fuel them, to propel them, to push them to a, an altitude, and then control them into a a a, a, f uh, a manner that can be flying, not tumbling, uh -huh. not turning. Uh, if it's uncontrolled, it can, anything can go. So right now, to prepare for this docking, um, the astronauts will have to essentially adjust the space station to the right uh, altitude, but it was a attitude, right? This is, uh, is this the right word yes. for this, <laughs> the attitude, um, kind of its, its, its relation to something else, and, uh, and keep it, to keep it at that precise, uh, I suppose, angle or whatever it is that we, that's needed. Do they have to constantly sort of uh, keep on the controls or can they leave the space station to sort of do its own adjustments? Well, I think uh, starting from the very first uh, satellites, uh, the altitude control has been auto uh, uh, automatically controlled Program. already. Okay. So more or less, that, let's say, uh, the whole process is controlled by computer. So the position... Oh, one minute to go yeah. now. So the position is very uh, is is automatically controlled, and also yeah. the okay. attitude. So one minute ago, and they were preparing for ignition very soon. And how long is uh, the pro uh, is the journey going to take for? Uh, roughly ten minutes, uh, because it's a very powerful engine, so it can go directly to the uh, to the uh, four hundred kilometers uh, altitude oh, with thirty seven degree uh, inclinations. Thirty seconds to go. Launch. There's a 20 second countdown to the ignition. Ten seconds to go. There it is, it's been ignited. They've got a pretty good view from where they are. Exactly. Also, well, you have seen, you have heard that the uh, technicians have reported the time, and that is a new time for calculating the orbit. So that timing is very important for calculating when it is to be separated to orbit. And then uh, this is very important for the preparation of around the boondock. So you see, this is the optical track. So this can be only seen by an optical telescope. And we're hearing series of... Uh, it's already in the cloud, I think, it's, so you cannot see very you can clearly. You can see the, the flames there. Yeah. Yeah. 
despite the uh, cloudy conditions, I think they're managing to get a pretty good view. But the cloud was there for three days and four days. They have just seen for 33 sec uh, 30 seconds. <laughs> So this, this is, is the camera on board the main booster. So you're seeing two of the strap-on boosters, mm. left and right. So this is on the core segment. Uh, you'll see very soon that this uh, uh, strap-on booster will be separated from the main engine, uh, from the main body of the rocket. And we can expect that in just a, a few minutes, perhaps? Yes, I think uh, it's happening uh, uh, any minute now. So uh, we're seeing that. So you can see that there are five flames. One is the core flame that is uh, hydrogen and oxygen mm. so this engine has very it's burning out a little bit isn't it yeah but you know this is the, this, the engine is uh, very particular because uh, it's the higher it flies the more powerful it is i mean what we call it the the ratio uh proportion ratio uh is more efficient uh, once in outer space but the kerosene is more efficient on the ground uh -huh. so we're using the kerosene as a booster uh, and then the uh, hydrogen and oxygen will be used uh, for outer space flight. So you're seeing these uh, strap-on boosters will be separate very soon, uh, once the fuel is burned out. Mm. Mm. They, will just fall into the uh, they will be falling into the Pacific, yes. Uh, well, that's the whole trajectory they designed this uh, launch, pad, uh, launch site in Hainan, so that it does not fall on the ground in the uh, habitat area. And then we're seeing that little, that's a simulation. So that's the simulation. This, you see the, uh, the, this is burning out, so the flame is not as, uh, as uh, powerful. So mm. it will have a separation very soon. And then will they, uh, will they be retrieved at all? Or will uh, they just be sort of left? Current plan is, uh, is uh, drop into the ocean and give it to the fish. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but we'll have, we do have, we see this uh, separation. So that will be dropped already. <laughs> so now the core engine is the only engine that works. Uh, we call it uh, YF-77. This is uh, the new generation liquid carries, carries uh, uh, hydrogen and oxygen engine. So mm. this, I think, is inside the fairing. So the next maneuver is the separation of the fairing. Once in outer space, what we call it uh, 110 kilometers altitude, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the fairing will be separate. You can see the middle is the seam of the fairing. We're using some uh, pyrotechnics to, to separate the fairing uh, once it's in, in, out, uh, in altitude, mm. uh, because there's no atmosphere to drag uh, uh, the rocket. So you see the separation of the fairing. Uh, so the fairing has been dropped. So the... Well, this is all very quick, isn't it? So, yes. Uh, so now that means that the rocket is in outer space. There's no atmosphere at, the, at this moment. So you're seeing the images now is the, uh, the Meng Tian itself, the, uh, the, space, uh, the segment itself. So the next move would be the separation between the Meng Tian and the rocket itself. Right. And the, uh, the finale would be this deployment of the solar panel. So that, that's what we're going to... Well, we would be considered as a success of the mission. That once you deploy the solar panel, that means that you have a, a right altitude and a right orbit, right. and you are ready to perform the rendezvous docking. So that's the main booster that's still going there, right? That we can see. Oh the yes, simulation. Uh, that's the, the what we call it the single stage rocket because oh. uh, the strapped on booster with the one engine can kick the whole payload into orbit. We obviously the boosters carry the propellant, but once it's uh, becomes once it's all used up and it's unwanted weight, it needs to be shed. But how much weight are these boosters? Well, the boosters, uh, are this uh, this segment is about uh, 20 metric tons because, but oh. once fully fueled, it has uh, the rocket itself along with the fuels has more than 800 ma metric tons. Oh, wow! So, uh, but is once it it's in, in orbit, the, the fuels are all burned out, and what you have uh, left is the fuel container along mm. with the engine itself. So that has, to, uh, once it's in, uh, in orbit, after the separation, it will cl uh, slowly come down to Earth and it will be disintegrated by, uh, 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 by burning uh, in the uh. atmosphere. So nothing will be left and there's no danger posed to the uh, to humankind. Mm -hmm. It's very environmentally friendly. <laughs> nothing left. Yes, but the separation is happening at the very high uh, orbit, uh, about 400 kilometers above the Earth. So the coming down of the uh, final segment, we call this final segment, even this uh, single segment, this is the final segment has to take some time. So mm. there's a, a, what we call it, international uh, uh, norm or practice 
to uh, what we we'll call it passivate the final segment. Passivate by means well, uh, by passivation we means that we uh, discharge the batteries, mm. uh, we vent the uh, containers, so it does not expose uh, uh, pose an explosion uh -huh. explosion uh, danger in orbit in orbit uh, because with the uh, solar yeah, radiation yeah, sometimes it create, increase the temperature and right. some of the containers can fragment in uh, in space so we use. A, a passivation technology to um, make it into a dummy so mm. it can grow, slowly come down to earth and disintegrate it in, in, in atmosphere. How long would that take? And that can take uh, differently. I mean, uh, can take, it can be years. Wow. Yeah. And is this something that, uh, I mean, is, uh, would this be considered something fairly new or is this something that's always been the, the norm? This the is uh, norm. Uh, in, uh, norm. Uh, I mean, the, the passivation is relatively new. Mm -hmm. uh, before that, we don't consider passivation as, as very important. Mm -hmm. uh, now we uh, to consider the uh, so Earth environment. You have to minimize yeah. the space debris. Uh, so passivation as well as the what we call end of life uh, propulsion of the satellites also very important. Either you push it back to atmosphere or you to push to the what we call a graveyard orbit, mm. so that you can move yeah, way, space move space away, space yeah. space. <laughs> make ways for new new developments. Mm. So how long do you think we have to wait until we see the um, the, the Meng Tian? The launching is roughly ten minutes more or less. Okay. So um, I think. Uh, in two or three minutes, yeah. maybe four or five, uh, we're, we're seeing the uh, end of the propulsion uh, of the, uh, the engine because the engine has its own capacity of fuel and mm. fuel has to burn out and it, it does not have a second kickoff. Kick uh, so it, it, it's a single burn. So once it's, you see the, the engine cease to burn, that means that we'll have separate. But, but before this, uh, the engine cease to burn, uh, the there has to be a control of the rocket to insert the, so you see they shut off the engine. Uh, so that means the, the separation oh, right. is happening. It's happening right now. Yeah. No, it is the moving lab the separation from yes. the long mass rocket. What you see that's is the, the that's, that's, from the rocket that's the itself, rocket itself, it? yeah. So the camera is on the rocket, but we're seeing the Meng Tian yeah. separating from it. So it's on its way, and how long do you think before it docks? Uh, in seconds, we'll uh, start the deployment of the solar panels, and uh, mm -hmm. I think the astronauts are able to communicate now already with the uh, with this uh, with Meng Tian, mm -hmm. and uh, and the ground crew is to to control the deployment of the solar panel before they move uh, any uh, make any movement because the batteries are limited right. on board, so they have to uh, to be very careful on the the next procedure. So the, the every procedure is very carefully designed. Mm, so you see the separate energy. <laughs> exactly. You see the separation of the segment that does not have any uh, major tumbles and turnings. So that means the altitude control can be easily done. So that is very important uh, for the preparation of the docking. So once the solar panels are deployed Jinshan
，文昌收到文昌民办，华生北京文昌报告，下面请文昌发二厂区指挥部邓红琴指挥长宣布发放任务结果。Yes, there's a what we call alignment in 150 kilometers, uh, 30 kilometers, and then uh, 10 kilometers, five, uh, and then up to the meters. So for alignment, there are many、uh, maneuvers that you have to to perform before you go ahead for the final docking. 各位领导，专家。Distinguished guests, their leaders, according to the flight data of、uh, Long March 5B Y4, and、uh, according to the calculation of Beijing Space Control Center, our Meng Tian Lab module has entered in the orbit successfully. Now I would like to announce a successful mission has been accomplished. Here, on behalf of the Long Site Command Center, I would like to extend a sincere gratitude to all the distinguished colleagues and their experts and distinguished officials for your kind support. This is the end of today's mission. Thank you very much. And、that's it. That's last. That's the last of the hardware, isn't it, for、exactly. uh, for the、and、space station? Every time they have a launch, the the screen turns red. I mean, <laughs> we're we're so used to that uh, to that uh, reddish thing. It's our auspicious color. So then, the, the next stage,、um, once this docks, the space station is complete, essentially.、Uh, right? What can, what we call it, the completion of the structure, the T shape.、Uh,